Welcome to On the Lord's Day here on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. My name is Eddie Parrish, and I'm the preacher for the Brown Trail Church of Christ in Bedford, Texas. Bedford is located about halfway between Dallas and Fort Worth. What you're about to watch is a recent worship assembly conducted at our meeting facility in Bedford. Jesus said in John 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. At the Brown Trail Church of Christ, that's what we desire to do, is to worship God in spirit and in truth according to His directions in the New Testament. And so I hope that you find our worship assembly today refreshing in its simplicity and in its conformity to the New Testament pattern. If you have any questions about what you see or hear today, we encourage you to contact us. Our address is the Brown Trail Church of Christ, Post Office Box 210667, Bedford, Texas 76095. Or if you'd like to send us an email, our address is office at Brown Trail Church of Christ. Com. Thank you for being with us today. God, we thank you for your kind blessings that you have graciously stored upon us. We're thankful, O oh Father, for your Son, Jesus, whose body was lifted up on the cross on a windswept hill so long ago. In his redemptive act, he sent faith and salvations to those who came before him and for those who will come after him. We're thankful, O oh Father, for your glorious church, that before the very foundations of the earth was laid, in your eternal great mind, you looked down through the annals of time, and you formed your holy church that is alive and well today in our world. We're thankful, O oh Father, for our nation, and what it has become to stand for in its ideals. We pray that we be a nation that leads people to a place of liberty, of hope, and of justice. We pray at this time for the leaders of our nation, for our president, for our Congress, for our Supreme Court, and for those who make decisions that will, let, that will affect the lives of those who are yet unborn. We pray that we will be your people, that in sum total of our thoughts and attitude and actions and hope, knowing that we are guided by your word and by the truth of liberty that you have planted in the hearts of all men. We ask and pray for where we live, for many are suffering in our state and other parts of our nation from the scourge of drought. We pray that you will send your blessings upon us, that the clouds may open with rain, that we will water the earth, and that life may begin anew. We pray for those among us who are ill, whose bodies are racked with pain. We ask and pray that the illness may be taken away and they once again may be able to go about their normal daily activities. We pray for the work of the church here, that we may send forth your word 
into a world that is lost and blind and groping in sin. Again, we're thankful for Jesus, his redemptive act, be with us henceforth and now forever. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Oh. had come to the place called Calvary. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this first day of the week, and we're thankful for Jesus, who some 2,000 years ago came to this earth. And an example to us, he came in a human form and became a man. Father, we know that he showed us an example how to live, and he gave his life on this cross that we may have hope of eternal life. And we take these emblems this time to remember his body and the blood that he shed on that cross because he loved us so. And we ask you now to be with us as we take of this bread in remembrance of his body. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. What the church is doing right now is partaking of the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted this observance on the very night that he was betrayed by Judas. At a gathering with his apostles, Jesus took two Passover food items, unleavened bread and grape juice, and told his apostles to eat the bread and drink the juice this time with new meaning, as symbols of his body and blood. Listen to Matthew's account of this event. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. Then, in the very next verse, Matthew 26, 29, Jesus told his disciples that he would not observe this memorial again with them until the kingdom was established. When the kingdom, also known as the church, came into existence in Acts 2, the disciples began to observe this memorial regularly, Acts 2, 42. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 reveals how regularly on the first day of the week. And so with those passages from the New Testament as our authority, we observe this memorial to Jesus Christ every first day of the week. Heavenly Father, we're reminded this morning of what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, that we have been bought with a price. And we know that Jesus paid that price at Calvary. We're thankful that he was willing to go to the cross and shed his blood for our sake. 
we realize that if we're redeemed, it is through that blood. If we're justified, it is by that blood. If we're cleansed from our sins, it is through that blood. And if we have victory over death, it is by that blood. Help us to think on these things as we partake of this cup, the fruit of the vine. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. According to the New Testament, the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper involves more than remembering Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us. It also involves some personal examination. Take note of Paul's inspired instruction to the church in Corinth. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 26 to 28. As the church continues this memorial observance today, we're not only thinking about what Jesus has done for us, we're also thinking about ourselves. We're looking deep within our hearts and lives to see if we've been living in harmony with God's will. We're considering whether or not our lives reveal how grateful we are for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And so this is a valuable time each week for the Christian. We gratefully remember Jesus and we humbly examine ourselves. O great and glorious Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Father, we come to you at this time thanking you for all the physical blessings that we have been blessed with in this life that you have bestowed upon us. We pray, Father, that as we prepare to give back a portion of that blessing, that we may do so in a way and in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. May your will be done, Father, in Christ we pray. Amen. One step at a time. Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak falsehood to one another, with flattering lips, and with a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Skies were blue that day. A day that most folks assumed would be just like any other. There was trouble in the world. There were battles being fought at various places on the planet, but not on our shores. Not until that day. We found ourselves under attack. And if you were to look up into those blue skies, You would have seen airplanes, but not 
in their normal use as we think of it. But airplanes being used as weapons against people on our shores. I've read about that day, but I was not alive to see it. It was December 7th, 1941, when America found itself under attack. A day that started out normally, but didn't end that way. And America would never be the same from that day forward. Fast forward. Some 60 years, almost, to another day that most of us do remember. When the blue skies once again saw planes being used as weapons. A day that people mark as a day that changed our nation in a lot of ways. For most of us, it's a day that we remember with sadness, for some it's bittersweet. Happy birthday, Kyle. But it's a day we'll not forget. We've all been through the mental exercise this week as Steve Lair reminded us on Wednesday night of where we were. I was in a gospel meeting that week in Shreveport, Louisiana. In a hotel room when my phone rang and it was Mary telling me to turn the TV on if I wasn't already watching the news, I wasn't. Sometime that day, I don't remember what I had planned to preach that night in the gospel meeting. But sometime that day, I decided that I would preach from the 12th Psalm. The lesson this morning is in essence the same lesson I preached that day on a Tuesday night in a gospel meeting. It's a text that I have returned to often in times when I could echo the words of David from the psalm as many people could that day ten years ago, and as many people I'm sure can do even today. In the twelfth psalm we find David, who remember was called a man after God's own heart, pouring out his heart to God. David in the psalm reveals his broken heart over what he perceived to be the increasing wickedness of humanity. And to say that that bothered him is to understate the case severely. As we look around today and we see what seems to be ever-increasing wickedness. What do we do?
We often lament what we consider to be the degradation of our society, the increasing wickedness of people in our world. And sometimes when we think about it, we feel powerless to do anything about it. But we should not feel so powerless. As we consider the 12th Psalm this morning, I want you to think about just two points. But I believe they're two very powerful points to which David calls our attention. I would offer to you in the first place that when we contemplate increasing wickedness in our culture, that we turn to God. That we turn to God. David begins the psalm by crying out, The godly man ceases. The faithful disappear from among the sons of men. David, of course, is doing two things. One, he's expressing himself in poetic fashion. The Psalms are poetry. They involve some exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. But in the second place, I don't think you can just take David's words as they are and say it's all because of poetry. I think David is pouring out his heart. He's expressing to God what he feels. Now what he feels may not be completely and technically accurate, similar to Elijah in 1 Kings 19, when he, when he expressed himself to God, I alone am left. That's how he felt. God told him there's still 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. But that didn't change the way Elijah felt about his circumstances. David is pouring out his heart to God, and as he looked around him, he saw wickedness, and it was to such a degree that the only way he felt that he could properly express himself to God was to say, the godly man ceases. The faithful have disappeared from the face of the earth. David was hurting. He was hurting because of what he saw around him. I remember ten years ago today having very similar thoughts. What's, ha what's happening to our world? What is wrong with people? What's happening to the human race morally, ethically, Spiritually, what has to be wrong with a person who thinks that he's doing good and thinks that he's doing right by flying commercial jets into the sides of buildings? What has to be wrong with a person to think that way? The same thing that's wrong with the person who places his stamp of approval on the death of 3,000 unborn each day in our country. I said it, and I meant it. What's wrong with people? In essence, God has been pushed aside. That's it. God Almighty, Jesus Christ, His Son, the Word inspired by the Spirit of God, has been pushed aside in people's lives and replaced by other things. That's ultimately what's wrong. And you can see it in all kinds of examples. The push by so many in our culture to remove God from 
the public. That, that God, for some reason, can't be associated in any way with anything that also has some kind of political tie. The rising numbers of cohabitation, people that just pushing marriage out the door and just live together. The breaking up of the home in that realm. Those that are pushing to redefine the home to involve same-sex partners. What about the increasing ridicule of Scripture? Radical atheism. The list is almost endless. But all examples of a lack of, inf a lack of divine influence in people's lives. David, back in Psalm 12, specifically mentions sins of the tongue with which he was dealing. Verse 2, they speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks proud things who have said, with our tongue will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who's Lord over us? What David looked around and saw in his day was not just untruth, falsehood, which we find in ours. He saw people who wanted to be able to express verbally to say anything that they wanted to say without being held accountable for it. Our lips are our own, they said. I can say whatever I want to, and who is Lord over us? To whom will I ever give account? <laughs> Does that sound familiar? People that want to be able to say whatever they want without being held accountable. Sounds like Hollywood to me. Want to be able to portray whatever they desire in their movies and the music industry. People that want to, want to express in words all kinds of things from rape to murder to whatever. And then if they're called on it, they say, well, no, it's, uh, it's only music. It doesn't really affect people. We want to be able to say whatever we want without any accountability. Funny to me, and this, is, this won't cost you anything, but the hypocrisy of that is appalling to me because... When in the music industry something is of a negative nature that's expressed in song and people say, aren't you afraid that's going to affect someone in a negative way? They're quick to say, oh, but it's just music. It, music does not affect people that way. People are not going to go out and do what this song says just because it's said in the song. Music doesn't affect people that way. But if it's a song that's, of, that's a positive song, has a very positive message that impacts people for good, and you ask them about that, they say, oh, isn't music such a wonderful thing that it can affect people in that way? Hypocrisy. Flattering lips. Lying lips. Basically, what David saw were people who lived as if there were no God and as if there were no judgment to come. And how many people does that describe in our world? So what do we do? Here was David's response. When he looked around him and saw the godly man ceases, the faithful are disappearing from among the sons of men, David's response was, Help, Lord! He turned to God. Help, Lord! Jesus said, the harvest 
indeed is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, the Lord of harvest, that He would send forth laborers into His harvest. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Paul told Timothy, pray for the rulers. Pray for those who are in authority that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. David said, help, Lord. When we look around and see what we perceive to be society heading in the wrong direction, turn to God. When was the last time that you as an individual in your own private place of prayer poured out your broken heart over the lost state of our world? When was the last time the lostness, if you will, of our world impacted you to such a degree that you went into your private place, fell down on your knees, and poured out your heart. Help, Lord! I'm not talking about our old worn-out expressions that we sometimes just parrot in our prayers. Bless all those for whom it is our duty to pray. Bless our leaders. Now let me get on to more important things. Do you know those people for whom it is your duty to pray? Do you know who they are? Do you know their names? Our leaders appreciate our brother leading us in prayer and how he mentioned specifically our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court. Thank you, Richard. Do we do that in private? Do we allow the circumstances of our lives to so impact us? Do we stop the busyness of our lives long enough to think long enough and hard enough about the circumstances in which we live that it drives us to our knees in prayer to God? Help, Lord! Or are we just too busy? Turn to God. Number two, trust God. Trust God. In verses 5 through 7, the psalm changes its direction a bit from David expressing himself to God to God expressing himself to David. Verse 5, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. There were a lot of people 10 years ago today who were looking for some stability, weren't they? Our world was being turned completely upside down. We didn't know what was going to happen next. People were longing for safety. They were longing for some sense of stability as they were trying to live through circumstances that seemed like they were going to take our stability and just remove it completely, forever. God says in this passage, if you want safety, if you want stability in your life, turn to me and trust me. I will arise. Sometimes we think God has forgotten us. But we need to, on those occasions, bring our feelings back into harmony with what we know to be true, back into harmony with reality. Reality like what? The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, Psalm 9, verse 9. 
that yea, though I walk through the valley, even of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Psalm 23, 4. That God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in time of trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Psalm 50, verse 15. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that God is going to completely remove all evil from the earth. We know that's the case because when God finally wraps up the affairs of this earth, we're told that there will be evil in the earth at that time. So when God says, I'll be a refuge to you, I'll be a strength to you, I will deliver you, He doesn't mean that He's going to remove all of the wicked from the earth that we might live without them in our presence. He means He will not leave us to face this world alone. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. He will deliver us not so much from oppression, He will deliver us through oppression. And God's words, the psalmist said, are pure like silver that's passed through the purifying fires seven times. In other words, it's impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6, verse 18. Titus 1, verse 2. His words are pure. And God will be our rock and our strength. Paul wrote to Timothy... One of the last things he ever wrote. He said, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for His heavenly kingdom. 2 Timothy 4, verse 18. Paul, not long after he wrote those words, would be killed executed by Caesar. Yet he wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God shall deliver me. Was he delivered? Yes, he was. Not from oppression, but through it. as He gained the victory that all of us hope to gain one day ourselves. With promises like that, that God will deliver, that God will be a strength, that God will be our help, our refuge. Promises like that from one who by His nature cannot lie. We should find great comfort and peace even if everything else in the world seems like it's falling completely apart. God says, Psalm 12, verse 5, I will set him in safety, the safety for which he yearns. As buildings were crumbling to the ground and valiant selfless people were losing their lives to try to help others. There was one thing and one thing only that offered me stability and a reason in the midst of all of that to hope. God. I want to close by calling your attention to verse 8 of Psalm 12. The wicked prowl on every side when vileness 
is exalted among the sons of men. It seems as if in that last verse, David offers his inspired commentary on why the circumstances were what they were. Why did he reach a point where he felt like the godly ceased? The wicked, the, the, the righteous were disappearing from the face of the earth. What was it that brought him to that point to where that was his perception? He said, you know, when things that are vile, things that are corrupt, things that are morally bankrupt, when those things are exalted among the sons of men, that's when the wicked prowl. Interestingly, the New American Standard translation says, the wicked strut on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Why does it seem like in our world today, in, in, in many different fronts, that the wicked are strutting, that they're unabashed, that they're in your face with their wickedness? Why? It's only because in many circles of our culture we have exalted that which is vile. We're just reaping what we've sown, folks, as a culture. Can't make a blanket statement. Not every individual certainly is guilty, but as a culture, as a society. What do we exalt? Pluralism? That, that every view, religiously, ethically, is on equal plane? That, that, that everyone has their own truth? You know, according to Scripture, that's vile. That's vile doctrine. But that's what we exalt in our culture. Some of those things we mentioned earlier, the breakup of the home, in, in so many different ways that, that, that our culture is trying to destroy the home, that's what we exalt, and that's vile. But the more morally corrupt things are exalted, the more empowered the wicked become. What do you do? Help, Lord. Let's quit reciting prayers and start praying to God. Can we do that? Can we pour out our hearts to God? Help, Lord. The God who says He will give stability, who said it then, is the same God we serve today. He can offer you, He does offer you, and can provide you stability. The ability to stand tall and stand firm and stand unwavering even when everything else in the world is falling apart around you. So come to Him. Accept His offer. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died for you. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ. Be immersed in water. Your sins will be washed away by His blood. You'll be added to His church. And all of those spiritual blessings of stability and access to God, all of that will be yours in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Christian, if you've not been trusting in God, Change. If you've not been praying to God, change. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we'll confess those sins. 1 John 1 verse 9. If you need to come today, please do, while we stand and sing together. <clears throat>
God Almighty, we come before you thanking you for the opportunity that we have to gather together and worship and praise you. And we pray that the worship that was offered this morning has been pleasing in your sight. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son that has made our ability to come before you possible. The, the love that he showed in submitting himself to your will to give his life for us. And we ask that you bless us and help us to live lives that are worthy of that. We, we pray, God, that you help us to always remember that you are our deliverance, that you are our salvation, that you will help us through the struggles and the trials that, uh, that we encounter every day. And please bless each one of us. And we ask that you dismiss us now and keep us safe under your guidance until we can meet together again. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us on the Lord's Day. If you have any questions about what you have seen or heard today during our worship assembly, please contact us. The Brown Trail Church of Christ, Post Office Box 210667, Bedford, Texas 76095. If you'd like to email us, that address is office at browntrailchurchofchrist.com. I hope and pray that God will richly bless you until we see you again on the Lord's Day. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify His name.